Hello, everyone. This is an incredible group of people. I just want to say hello and thank you for being here. Um, it's an honor to be up here and being, uh, feeling you wanting to hear us speak. I am going to talk about science, and I'm going to talk about medical research, and I'm going to talk about um, post-traumatic stress disorder, and I'm going to talk about a drug called MDMA and the larger context of psychedelic drugs and how psychedelic drugs may, be, may offer us some healing in our uh, world. This is Sergeant Tony Macy. And Tony um, is an incredible human being. He was 19 years old, and he, the, the war started in Iraq, and he wanted to serve his country. And he signed up, and he was sent overseas. Fourteen months later, he came back, and in his words, he was no longer innocent and no longer young. He was in his room a lot. He had trouble communicating with his friends and with his family, and he kept reliving the experience of trauma at war repeatedly. And this is what he says in his own words. I was unconsciously living a life of denial and hate, coping with pills, trying to numb the pain, but only numbing my soul. I saw no point in life anymore. And unfortunately, Tony is not unusual. Um, 22, an average of 22 veterans a day commit suicide in the United States. And it's a national tragedy, and we need to do something about this. And a lot of people are working to do something about this. 20%, according to the Veterans, of, uh, Veterans Affairs, 20% of the veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan have post-traumatic stress disorder. And post-traumatic stress disorder is a condition that you get from a trauma, like war, or you can get it from uh, abuse, spousal abuse, uh, natural disasters, and accidents. And the post-traumatic stress, the reason it's a disorder is you don't get over it. It continue, continually go back into the experience of being in the trauma, and it's related to depression, thoughts of suicide, um, hypervigilance, always looking around to see when the next uh, tr you know, attack is going to come. And, they, and you get stuck in it. And since it's such a problem with our veterans and others, but the veterans especially, we've put them in harm's way, and we have sort of a responsibility to cure them. A lot of people are looking at, how, what do we do? What's the treatment? A third, a full third of people that are not responding to current treatments that are available. So this is a lot of people. One of the places that is... Uh, looking at a good a treatment that's showing results is located here in Santa Cruz. The headquarters are in Santa Cruz, and we, uh, I work for that organization, MAPS, and MAPS stands for the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. And we are taking MDMA and putting it together with psychotherapy, talk therapy, and Put, getting people to take these studies, we're in what's called phase two studies, clinical trials. You have phase one for safety, then you have phase two to sort of understand it more, and then you have phase three when you make it actually into a drug. We're a nonprofit organization, but we are um, in currently in phase two clinical trials. It's unusual for a nonprofit, but it's a growing area. There's a lot of AIDS medications that were developed by nonprofit drug development companies. So, what this is is the, the, er, the, the MDMA part is the drug that is um, not ecstasy and molly, <laughs> although it started out that way. Ecstasy or molly is the street drug, the street names. And we did studies of that and found that only 50% in the study that we did, only 50% of the ecstasy had any MDMA in it at all. Often it's some chemical combination, cocktail of different kinds of chemicals. The other 50% of the molly and ecstasy that you buy in the street is maybe has a little MDMA, but then it has a bunch of other stuff as well. So we're talking about pharmaceutical grade MDMA. And before it was made illegal in 85, and before it got out into the public, it was used by therapists. So there's a history of understanding about what this drug does from therapists. And a lot of that informs the therapy. So we use this um, knowledge of early MDMA and early LSD studies by Stan Groff, primarily uh, before these drugs became illegal, and we're taking that therapeutic research, and we've developed some protocols to treat people. And 
the results, oops, sorry, that's Tony after the treatment. Um, the results have been incredible. Uh, in our first study, the pilot study that's been completed and published, we were only working with treatment-resistant sufferers. So these are people that have tried everything, and I've talked to some of them. And they've tried therapy, they've tried drugs, they've tried all, um, alternative therapies, everything, and nothing works. The average time that people had post-traumatic stress disorder in our first study was 19 years. These are people that really, I'm, I would hope someday you could hear some of them talk. It's, it's heart um, rendering. In our first study, it was mostly women victims of uh, domestic abuse and sexual abuse. So these people come through the study in the first study, and over 80% no longer had post-traumatic stress disorder after 19 years. So it works. Now, these are small numbers that we're still working with here, so we need to go to phase three where we are working with hundreds of people. But it does show that there is promise in this method. Um, another thing about MDMA is that it has a fairly low risk profile. So the uh, National Institute of Health did a study showing MDMA had less harm on the body um, than alcohol, for example. And in our studies, we are doing our clinical studies, and then we're also looking at all research about all MDMA that's been done. And we have found that um, out of 600 clinical uses of MDMA, the pharmaceutical MDMA, out of 900 uses, there was only one drug-related adverse event. So, and that person recovered. It was a heart problem, and he recovered, though. So it's a fairly low risk profile. What happened with Tony? Um, he was desperate. He had post-traumatic stress disorder. He was searching the internet, and he found the study that was taking place in South Carolina with the Mitzhoffers. He enrolled. He was, met the criteria, was accepted, and did the uh, three sessions of the therapy without the drugs and an eight-hour session with the drug, three, three sessions without drugs. And that cycle of not drug, drug, uh, not drug is repeated two to three times, depending on the study. Um, he did it twice, the cycle and um, he feels like he no longer has post-traumatic stress disorder. He, um, let's look at his own words. After the MDMA took effect, my soul sparked back to life. I felt connected to a vibrant life force, and I awakened to a childlike curiosity and inner power. I'm not perfect, but I've learned a lot about myself. If something gets the fear going, I can see it as something I can learn from. So that really helps. What the MDMA does, it releases oxytocin, which you might have heard about. That's the bonding hormone. That's the hormone that's released in your body when you're nursing a child or after sex when you've had an orgasm. It connects people. It's like the bonding or the nursing hormone. It also affects the amygdala, the part of the brain, that the flight or fight response, you know? So it helps you get through fear. And it also increases serotonin, which is the feel-good part, uh, makes you feel better. And it's that bonding and feeling better and being able to be with fear that, along with the therapy, non-directive therapy, that we think helps, uh, get that helps provide durable remission from post-traumatic stress disorder. So why, if it works, why is there's no government support, there's no foundation support, um, there's very little support, and the drug companies don't want to put, uh, develop this drug because it's off patent. It was developed a um, hundred years ago by Merck and uh, put on the shelf. They didn't use it, it didn't work for what they were trying to use it for. And so it was discovered again in the 60s, um, and sh the person who discovered it shared it with his therapist friends and it got into the public. And this government, uh, it began to be misused recreationally, and the government made it illegal in 1985. So there's no reason to develop it because there's no economic benefit. And there, it's only used two or three times for the cure, so there's no sort of ongoing use of it as, as well. Um, so nonprofits have stepped in to fill the need to, to develop it further. But the other, re you know, and the other reason, of course, is just that it's illegal. I mean, when I say MDMA or I say ecstasy, probably most of you in the room go, whoa, not that drug. It, so there is a reputational risk to develop this. 
Psychedelics just means mind manifesting. It's not a clinical term. It's a class of drugs um, that are currently being investigated by a lot of people. Uh, we are doing the MDMA uh, assisted psychotherapy for the post-traumatic stress disorder. A new study has started in Los Angeles with MDMA for social anxiety in autistic adults. We're st there's a new study in Marin with, for end-of-life anxiety. Um, and then there's other drugs. So LSD was just, uh, we did MAPS, the organization I work for, just completed a study with LSD, the first study in f over 40 years for end-of-life anxiety. People felt um, not so afraid of dying, people with cancer. They could reconnect with their friends. There's other organizations doing a lot of work with psilocybin, which is the ingredient in the psilocybin mushroom, and they are working on smoking cessation, uh, obsessive-compulsive disorder, and end-of-life anxiety, and they're also doing work with spirituality, spiritual growth, and openness. And then a lot of people are doing um, research on Ayahuasca, which is a plant from South America, a plant, it's a, two plants actually that are combined together, and not so much clinical studies, because with clinical studies you need to do the double blind placebo controlled you know, environment, and you can't really do that with ayahuasca. It's a plant that requires um, a teacher or shaman or spiritual leader to lead you through the process. But a lot of people have been studying it, and a lot of scientists and researchers are studying it from an observational standpoint. And same with ibogaine. Ibogaine is a plant from West Africa, and that's shown a lot of um, efficacy for treating opiate addictions. So there's all this research going on, and if you want to know more about the research, there's a website, um, psychedelicscience.org, psychedelicscience.org. There's over 80 studies and videos and talks, and you can look up the researchers and find out where they are and what they're doing. Um, one of the things that happens... Um, I'm going to go back and so you don't read that while I'm talking. One of the things that happens, I just want to say before I read this, is that people take it and they get healed, and a couple of people in the early studies have told me the only thing wrong with being healed is, healed is that I um, have survivor's guilt, and especially Tony. He said, you know, my soldiers, my warriors, my fellow warriors that I went through war with, they still have PTSD, I've got to do something. And so he called the office and said, what can I do? And I said, well, you can write the year-end fundraising letter. <laughs> and so he wrote, he did, and he was like so excited. He's also on a video. He's just, he really wants to have this available for more people. And this is what he said. One thing I learned from the military that I hold true is that you never leave a fallen soldier behind. MDMA-assisted psychotherapy worked for me, and I think it can work for others as well. We need evidence-based research to have the medicines we need. By adding this tool, we can help a lot of people, substantially. So Tony's story is incredible. And there's a lot of stories. I work at MAPS. I work at an organization, and they say, well, what do you do? And I say, I work at an organization called the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. <laughs> and then all these stories come pouring out because they feel that I'm safe, and they say, well, I was healed, and oh, I had this experience, and oh my, you know, and they have all these incredible stories. And some people tell me stories of suffering. Some people have had bad experiences with these drugs because they're powerful drugs. And instead of providing scientific evidence of when it's helpful to use the drug and when it's not helpful to use the drug, and what drug should be used for which condition, and what are the contraindications that you should never do the drug if you have certain... Uh, issues that I don't want to get into the details of it, but there, you know, there's contraindications like there is with all drugs. So we need to do this. We need to take these stories and we need to investigate them further and we need to continue to do the clinical research so that we can see how these drugs can heal because they obviously have some efficacy and some value in healing some of our most uh, difficult conditions of our time for trauma, for um, anxiety, for these kinds of things that are, that are important to, to heal. And we need to use science and compassion and not fear and understand these drugs so that we can help heal. Thank you.